Peyton's mum put her hand to her chest and let out a sigh of relief. There you are. Good. I thought you'd just be gone for 20 minutes or so, but it's almost been an hour. I was worried about you because, well, you know, she didn't have to finish. I'm sorry, mum, Peyton said. I didn't mean to worry you. It's okay, her mum said, then looked at Abigail. Hi, Abigail. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see you too, Mrs. Thompson. You should come on home though, Peyton, her mum said. Dinner's almost ready. Peyton stood up. Okay. She turned to Abigail. Let's hang out soon. Definitely, Abigail said. And let me know if you hear anything about Marley. Peyton felt a stab of guilt that was becoming very familiar. I will. Peyton sat down at the dinner table with her mum and dad like she did every night. Tonight they were having roasted chicken with rice and broccoli, all of which she liked well enough. But when she put a chunk of chicken in her mouth and tried to chew it, it tasted like dust. She knew there was no way she could swallow it, so she spat it out into her napkin and hoped nobody noticed. I know it's been a tough day, honey, but you should try to eat your strength to eat to keep your strength up, her mum said. So much for nobody noticing. I can't, Peyton said, pushing away her plate. I mean, how can life go on as normal when something so bad has happened? How can people just go on eating dinner and doing homework and brushing their teeth and going to bed like everything's fine? It's a good question, her dad said, looking thoughtful. I guess people go on doing normal things because it's the only thing they can do. Just go on living and hope things get better, which they generally will over time. Peyton burst into tears. Things would never get better for Marley, and it would be a long, long time until things got better for Marley's parents and brother. But what if they don't, she said, sobbing. What if they never do? Peyton's mum and dad looked at each other the way they did when she asked a question they couldn't answer. Peyton didn't give them time to come up with anything. She knew they had no answers. No one did. She stood up. May I be excused, please? Sure, honey, her mum said. But later you're going to have to eat something before you go to bed. Mum's orders. Peyton climbed the stairs to her room, flopped down on her bed, and cried some more. Apparently, she carried an endless well of tears inside of her. She couldn't believe she hadn't run out of them by now. Today had been the hardest day of her life. The only tight bright spot was her talk with Abigail. She was glad the ice between them was thawing. She had forgotten how easy Abigail was to talk to, how natural things went between them. It was a different dynamic from Peyton's friendship with Marley. Peyton was always trying to impress Marley, to win her approval, so she was always a little on edge around her. She knew Abigail accepted her as she was, so when she was with Abigail, she could just be herself. Still, Peyton wished more than anything that she could see Marley again, that she could hear Marley laugh and call her a dork because of some stupid joke she had made. After a long cry, Peyton took out her homework and tried to get started on it, but it was useless. What was the point of doing homework when people you loved could just disappear in the blink of an eye? Making an effort of any kind seemed pointless. There was a light knock on the door. Can I come in? Her mum asked. I guess so. Peyton mumbled into her pillow. Her mum was carrying a tray from which sweet and spicy smells emanated. Hey, I made you some hot chocolate and cinnamon toast. I figured you might be able to eat it when you couldn't eat anything else. Cinnamon toast and hot chocolate had always been Peyton's go-to comfort food when she was sick or sad. Her mum had been making it for her since she was a toddler. Peyton sat up in bed. Thanks. Her mother's kindness made her cry a little more especially when she thought about how she was lying to her mum about Marley. You're welcome. Her mum handed Peyton a saucer holding the slice of cinnamon toast and set the mug of hot chocolate on the bedside table. I think I'd like to be left alone now, if that's okay, Peyton said. Looking at her mum's face made her feel too guilty. Not until I've seen you eat at least half that cinnamon toast, her mum said, sitting down on the foot of the bed. Okay. Peyton nibbled the cinnamon toast and took a sip of hot chocolate. It was strange how these things could still taste good even when life was so bad. I've never had anything happen to me like what happened to you today, her mum said. It's hard when you're the parent and you can't think of anything to say to make your kid feel better. Her mum looked like she was in a danger of crying herself. I guess all I can say is that your dad and I are here when you need us. Peyton nodded, too full of emotion to speak. Now, were you able to do your homework? Her mum asked. Peyton shook her head. How about I write your teachers a note? They'll know what happened and they know Marley is your best friend. 
I bet they'll let you turn it in on Monday, and who knows, by then Marley might be back home safe and sound. She patted Peyton's leg and got up from the bed. Thanks, Mum, Peyton said, even as she knew Marley was neither safe nor sound. Peyton brushed her teeth, climbed into bed and curled up in a little ball. She was sure she wouldn't be able to sleep, that the exhaustion of the day had been too much for her, and she lost consciousness as though she had experienced a physical trauma, not just an emotional one. She was surrounded by the whirring and churning of machinery. She looked around and saw she was in Freddy Fazbear's pizza kit factory. She was alone. She had gotten separated from her group, and she needed to find them. She entered a dimly lit room, where vats of tomato sauce gurgled as they bubbled and boiled. She looked around frantically for any sign of her classmates or teacher. There was no one. On the floor in front of the vats was a big black pot like a witch's cauldron. It was hanging over an open fire that had been built with some logs. An open fire inside a building, Peyton thought. How is that even safe? A familiar figure from Peyton's early childhood walked out and took his place behind the cauldron. It was a big, furry Freddy Fazbear with his tiny top hat and familiar grin. Freddy was carrying a big burlap bag, the kind that Christmas cards always showed Santa carrying. Humming to himself, Freddy reached into his bag and pulled out a long-handled wooden spoon. He dipped the spoon into the cauldron of sauce and then stirred. He dipped up a spoonful of sauce, sniffed it, then tasted it thoroughly. Or thoroughly? Thoughtfully. <laughs> Freddy reached back into his bag and pulled out a human arm, pale and thin. He dropped it into the pot of sauce and stirred. He dipped into the bag and pulled out a foot next, a girl's foot, small with the toenails painted baby pink. He dropped it too, into the bubbling cauldron. Horror was building in Peyton. Horror, but also comprehension. She was terrified of what he was going to pull out next, but she couldn't look away. Freddy reached into the bag one more time and retrieved a severed head that he held by its luxurious blonde hair. At first, Peyton couldn't see the face, but as Freddy turned the head around, she saw it was Marley, her eyes wide and unseeing, her mouth open in a silent scream. Oh my god! That is brilliant writing! That's so good! Oh, that makes up for all the spelling mistakes. Now, let me just, give me a second, because this is an amazing part. But that, those two words, silent scream, is so spine-chilling to me, because it's, what is it, a juxtaposition? I think it's a juxtaposition, because you can't have a silent scream, because screams are really loud, and silence is quiet, obviously, and so it's a juxtaposed uh, thingy. But that sentence is mad! Oh my god! Freddy let go of the hair, and the head landed in the cauldron of, of sauce with a splash. This is amazing. Peyton woke up, gasping for breath. There would be no more sleeping tonight. I heard she ran away, one girl said to another standing in front of the lockers. I heard she ran off with Sean Anderson, the other girl said. But that can't be right, because Sean's at school today. I heard she ran off to New York City to be a model, a girl who had been listening on the conversation weighed in. The gossip buzzed in Peyton's ears. Her head felt like a hive of angry bees. She sat in her math class, but she couldn't concentrate. A voice came on over the intercom. Peyton Thompson, please report to the front office. Peyton felt a knot of fear form in her stomach. Whatever this is, it can't be good. Like a prisoner awaiting her sentence, she rose from her desk and walked to the office, consumed with dread. When she reached the office, she wasn't comforted by the sight of a police officer standing by the front desk with her mum right beside him. Peyton's mind buzzed with panicked questions. Did the police know she was lying? Had they told her mum? Could a person get arrested for lying? Hey, her mum said. Peyton could tell she was trying to sound casual, but the tone of her voice was strained and her brow was wrinkled like it got when she was worried or upset. Officer Jacobs wants to ask you a few questions since you've been the last... You seem to be the last person who saw Marley. Peyton shifted from foot to foot. She couldn't meet her mum's eyes, let alone the police officers. I don't know if I was the last person who saw her. Well, the other kids all seemed to have lost track of her in the factory sooner than you did. Her mum said, her voice getting shakier with every word. And apparently nobody working in the factory says they saw a girl who got separated from the field trip group. I won't take up much of your time, and then you can get back to class, Officer Jacob said. He was a large, bald man with a gentle face. Under other circumstances, Peyton wouldn't have been scared of him. 
Officer Jacobs looked over at the secretary behind the front desk. Ma'am, is there some place private we could sit down and talk? The, sec the secretary stood up. Of course, let me show you to the conference room. Peyton sat in the small room beside her mum and across from Officer Jacobs. She felt like she was on one of those crime dramas her mum watched all the time. She wondered if her mum found this kind of drama less entertaining when it was in real life. So you rode the bus with Marley on the field trip? The officer asked, his pen poised above a notepad. Yes, sir, Peyton said. She felt sweaty and wondered if it was noticeable. We rode together on the way to the factory. Officer Jacobs nodded. And then you were together for the tour? For part of it, yes. But it was like we were together and then we weren't. It's not a lie, Peyton told herself. Officer Jacobs wrote something down. And where were you in the process of touring the factory when you noticed Marley was missing? Peyton started to sweat more profusely. What had she told her parents when they had asked her a question? The containers of pizza toppings. She was pretty sure she had told them they'd been near the containers of pizza toppings. Uh, okay. She's going to mix up lies and, that, and that's, that's what's going to be the breaking point. Um, previous to this experience, Peyton had not been in the habit of telling lies. She was discovering how hard it was. Once you came up with a story, you had to stick with it, regardless of whom you were talking to. Exactly. It wasn't easy to remember the details and use them consistently. Um, we were near the containers of pizza toppings, I think, Peyton said. That was when you noticed she wasn't there, the officer said. Yes, sir. I turned around and she was gone. Uh, hang on. He, he should pick up on the fact that she didn't tell a teacher or anything that, that she was missing. And, and the teacher just found out by herself. Right? So, uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> the officer jotted something else down on his notepad. Peyton wished she could see what it, he was writing. She feared it was the word liar. The officer looked up from his notepad. Had she said anything to you about leaving or maybe about any about having plans to meet someone later? No, sir. Peyton reconsidered. Well, she didn't say anything about meeting anybody or anything like that, but she did say that the tour was lame and a waste of time. So I figured maybe she just left. The officer raised an eyebrow. Without saying goodbye to her best friend? Well, that's not what Marnie's like. She does what she wants when she wants. If she got bored and decided she was going to go, she would have just gone. She's done it before. The officer jotted something else down. Well, thank you for your time. We'll be in touch if we need to ask you anything else. We're working very hard to find your friend. Okay, that's good, Peyton said, but she knew it didn't sound like the right thing to say. It was hard to sound hopeful about their efforts when she knew good and well that there was no chance that they were going to find Marley alive. Can I go back to class now? The officer nodded. As they left the conference room, Peyton's mum put her arm around her shoulders. I know that was hard. I'm proud of you. Are you going to be okay for the rest of the day? Peyton nodded, but tears sprang to her eyes. She knew her mum wouldn't be proud of her if she knew the truth. Oh my god, this is hard. <laughs> It'll be okay, her mum said, giving her a little squeeze. I just have a feeling you're going to see be seeing your friend uh, again real soon. In a home economics class, oh no, this is where they get the pizza boxes. And it's going to be Marley in, in, in it or something. I don't know. I don't know, what, I don't know what to expect. Ah! In a home economics class, Mrs. Crutchfield stood next to a table stacked high with pizza boxes. As you can see, our Freddy Fazbear pizza kits have been delivered, she said, looking around at the class. Each pizza box has a student's name on it. When I call your name, come get your pizza kit. In order to save time, I took the liberty of preheating all the ovens to 425 degrees. 425? Oh, of course, that's Fahrenheit, isn't it? <laughs> I was like, 425 Celsius? Um, bake your pizza for 12 to 14 minutes, according to the directions on the box. And then, bon appetit. She picked up the pizza box and said, Emma? Emma came to claim her pizza kit and Mrs. Crutchfield continued calling the students' names. One by one, the girls shuffled to the front of the room to get their pizza creations. When a girl named Hannah came up to get hers, she asked, Mrs. Crutchfield, is there a pizza kit with Marley's name on it? No, dear, I'm afraid not, Mrs. Crutchfield said, not meeting Hannah's eyes. Sadly, Marley disappeared before she could choose the ingredients for her pizza kit. But the police are looking for her and I'm sure they'll find her safe and sound. Despite the reassuring words, Mrs. Crutchfield's tone did not sound confident. She picked up another pizza box. Peyton? She called. Peyton got up from her seat next to the one Marley used to occupy. She, she walked to the front of the room and claimed her pizza kit. The box was white with red letters, spelling out Freddy Fazbear's pizza kit. 
with a picture of Freddy smiling the same way he had in Peyton's dream the night before. The box was soggy on the bottom and when she pulled her hand away it was red with what she hoped was with all her heart was tomato sauce. Of course it's tomato sauce, she told herself. What else could it be? Tomato sauce. She thought of the big steaming vat of tomato sauce where Marley had in all likelihood met her doom. Which would happen first if you fell into a vat like that? Would you drown or be boiled alive? Or would you be beaten to death by the giant always turning paddles that stirred the sauce? She lifted her fingers to her nose and sniffed them to make sure the red liquid had tomato sauce's familiar tang. The smell of blood also had a tang. Stop it, Peyton told herself. You're freaking out. If people see you freak out, they'll get suspicious. They'll know. Peyton, are you alright? Mrs Crutchfield's voice penetrated Peyton's racing mind. What? Oh, yes, Mrs Crutchfield. Then please take your seat until the other girls have picked up their pizza kits. Yes, ma'am. Peyton quickly sat down. She had no idea how long she'd be standing at the front of the classroom, lost in her panicky thoughts. All around, her classmates were opening their pizza kits, ooing and ahhing over them as if they were presents on Christmas morning. Their comments all blurred together in Peyton's confused, frightened brain. Hey, this looks pretty good. Looks way better than the mystery nuggets the nuggets the cafeteria is serving for lunch today. Sausage and mushroom with extra cheese, my favourite. They weren't stingy with the extra cheese either. <laughs> with shaking hands, Peyton opened her own pizza kit. She looked down at the box's contents. Something about it didn't feel right. Red liquid pooled in the bottom of the box. The crust was not the usual pale colour of dough, but closer to the colour of a bandaged approximations of Caucasian skin. Oh my god! With one trembling finger, she reached out and touched one of the pepperoni slices. It was soft and smooth. That's not usually how pepperoni usually felt, was it? She thought of the game played in the dark at Halloween parties where you passed around the peeled grapes and said, These are the dead man's eyes. Then the cold spaghetti noodles. These are the dead man's guts. Peyton felt her stomach roll with nausea and her mouth fill with saliva. She couldn't be sick. If she got sick, it would call attention to her and make people think she knew more than she was saying. She swallowed hard, fighting her body's stronger urge to vomit. She would not be sick. She would not call attention to herself. She would bake her pizza and eat it just like everybody else. The thought of eating the pizza filled her with a disgust, more intense than any feeling she had ever known in her life. But she was going to do it. She had to do it. Oh no, she's a cannibalist. <laughs> in the kitchen area, she took the soggy, dripping pizza from the box and slid it into the oven next to the other girl's pizzas. Drops of red liquid fell from her pizza and splattered onto the clean white floor. Whoa, Peyton, you went a little heavy on the red sauce, didn't you? Hannah said. <laughs> Peyton forced a smile and shrugged. What can I say? It's my favourite part. She grabbed a paper towel and wiped up the mess. The other girls waited happily for their pizzas, talking about how they were starving and couldn't wait to eat them. Peyton waited with a growing sense of dread. She hoped desperately that someone would pull a fire alarm, and by the time they returned to the classroom, the pizzas would be burnt and inedible. Or maybe she could drop hers on the floor so she wouldn't have to eat it. No, dropping it would make everybody look closely at her and closely at the pizza. They knew, they would know there was something wrong with her and something wrong with it. When the bell on the oven timer rang, Peyton jumped like a bomb had exploded. There was no avoiding it. It was pizza time. As Mrs. Crutchfield had said it, bon appetit. <laughs> with shaking hands, Peyton took her pizza out of the oven. Oven. She took out the pizza cutter and held it over the hot pie, feeling like she was wielding a deadly weapon. The sound of the sharp metal wheel slicing through the cheese and cheese and sauce, and separating the crust into quarters was like a machete slicing through flesh. All around her, girls exclaimed over their pizzas. It smells so good! I want to take a bite right now, but I don't want to burn my mouth. The cheese is so gooey and stretchy. Peyton picked up her pizza and carried it to her table. She sat down and stared at it. The sauce was blood red. She poked the dough with her finger. It was soft and somehow fleshy. The pepperoni reminded her of a tongue. Oh my god! <laughs> the girls at the other tables were gobbling their pizza slices, laughing and having a great time. Peyton stared down at the unappetizing pizza. The pizza was evidence of how she had abandoned Marley, abandoned her and then lied about it. 
Peyton had no choice. She had to destroy the evidence. She had to eat it. <sighs> she swallowed hard to force down the lump that had formed in her throat. She picked up the first slice and took a tiny nibble from the tip of the triangle. It tasted salty and greasy and metallic and wrong somehow. The texture of the dough was different than any pizza she had ever eaten before. Fatty. Grisly. How could dough be grisly? She chewed and chewed, but somehow the food didn't seem to be breaking down the way it should. It almost seemed like it was growing bigger in her mouth instead of smaller. With great effort, she forced herself to swallow and felt the solid doughy ball work its way with difficulty down her esophagus toward her stomach. She was reminded of a nature document she saw once that showed a large boa constrictor eating a rat hole. You could see the shape of the unfortunate rodent as the snake's muscles forced it down its throat and into its belly. Jesus Christ. <laughs> the difference was that this snake appeared to be enjoying the rat way more than she was enjoying this pizza. But there was no choice. She had to take another bite. And another. Each one was worse than the one before. <clears throat> now that it was cooked, the pepperoni had the texture of peeling sunburnt skin and the sauce had a coppery tang like once when P Peyton had cut her finger and stuck it in her mouth. She couldn't let thoughts like this flood her mind, not if she was going to finish this pizza. She tried to take bigger bites to make it go faster, but it soon became apparent that this wasn't a good idea. The big chunks landed in her stomach, as heavy as rocks, and when she looked at the pizza on her plate, it didn't look significantly smaller. One slice. Most of the other girls had finished their pizzas and were washing their plates at the kitchen station, chatting and laughing. Peyton had only made it through one slice. Eating this pizza was like swallowing stones. Are you alright, Peyton? Peyton looked up to see Mrs Crutchfield standing beside her table, looking at her with a concerned expression. I beg your pardon, Peyton said. It was hard to talk. The last bite she took of the pizza was still hung in her throat. I was asking if you were alright, Mrs Crutchfield said. You look pale. I'm fine, Peyton said, though of course she wasn't. Mrs Crutchfield looked down at Peyton's mostly uneaten pizza. Do you not like what you made? Oh, I like it. It's just very... filling. <laughs> Mrs Crutchfield looked at her for a moment. I know it must be hard on you with Marley missing, but I'm sure she'll turn up soon. She's right here, Peyton thought. Right here on my plate. <sighs> for a second, she thought she might actually laugh. She feared she was losing her mind, but she nodded and said, Thank you, Mum. I hope so. Peyton was forcing down the last bite of pizza when the bell rang to change classes. She felt ill and bloated as if the dough were expanding in her stomach, as if it might keep on expanding and expanding until she burst like a blood-filled tick. She suffered through the last class of her day, her stomach churning, and then suffered even more on the bus ride home, as every bump and pothole the bus drove over made the... Um, unstable contents of her stomach threatened to evacuate the premises. She stumbled through the front door of the house. Hey hun, her mum called from the kitchen. Any word on Marley? Peyton could barely get the word uh, get out the word no. Her mum appeared in the living room and looked at her with a knitted brow. You okay, sweetie? You don't look so good. Oh my god, you know what's gonna happen? She's gonna be sick and it's gonna be and Marley's just gonna come out of her stomach or whatever. Sick Peyton managed to get out with a great effort. Something I ate. Oh, that's too bad, Mum said. And I'm sure worrying about Marley isn't helping any. I hope you feel better by dinner time. I'm making pot roast, your favourite. Her mum's pot roast usually was her favourite, but now the thought of it sickened her. The stringy meat stewed in its own fat and juices. Even the carrots and onions and potatoes were saturated in the juices of dead cow. First came death, then the butchering, then the cooking and eating of the flesh. Peyton feared that the Freddy Fazbear's pizza kit had been her last experience eating the meat of another creature. From now on, assuming she could ever bring herself to eat anything again, she would be a vegetarian. Peyton remembered a vegetarian kid in middle school who used to wear a t-shirt with pictures of animals on it that said, don't eat your friends. <laughs> After today, these words had taken on a new meaning. Maybe you should take an antacid and go lie down, her mum said. Peyton nodded and dragged herself up the stairs to her room. She didn't take an antacid um, because she didn't think she could swallow anything and keep it down, not even medicine. She curled up on her bed and moaned softly in misery, drifting in and out of consciousness. Peyton's stomach churned. She had experienced indigestion and stomach viruses in the past, but never had her digestive system made this much noise. It rumbled. 
then sloshed, then gurgled so loudly that if anybody had been in the room with her, they would have heard it and asked what was wrong. Maybe lying curled up on her side wasn't the best choice, she thought. Maybe it was better to stretch out so her stomach wouldn't be so smooshed. She lay on her back, a wave of nausea washed over her, followed by sharp, almost unbearable pangs. Without really meaning to, she put her hands on her stomach. Something from inside her body bumped up against her palms like it was trying to push its way out. What was it? It was horrible. Peyton lifted her shirt so she could see her belly, usually flat. Now it was expanding and contracting in a way she wasn't controlling. It felt like something she was beating. Uh, it, was so, it felt like something was beating her up from the inside, punching her stomach so hard it was going to leave bruises. This was not a normal stomach ache. There was something inside her, something other than disgusting pizza she had barely choked down in home economics class. Peyton had once watched a gross TV show about how pe about people infested with parasites. There had been a woman on the show who had had a giant tapeworm living in her stomach. The woman ate and ate, but kept getting thinner because the tapeworm devoured everything she consumed. Finally, the woman learned that sometimes if you left a piece of food on your tongue, the tapeworm would crawl up to get to it, to get it and then it would be pulled out of your body. The woman had, a, had set a piece of raw steak on her stomach and the tapeworm had crawled out of her stomach, up her esophagus and into her mouth. When she pulled it out, it was eight feet long. I hate tapeworms. Um, Peyton remembered that this woman had kept the deceased tapeworm in a jar on her mantle, which did not strike Peyton as a sound decorating choice. When she was thinking clearly, it really made no sense for her to believe that the pizza she had eaten had contained pieces of barley. However, wasn't it possible that she had swallowed a worm? People ingested parasites all the time. If they didn't, why would there be a TV show about it? Maybe that was what had made her so sick, she wondered. If she put a piece of food on her tongue, would whatever was inside her crawl up to get it? Her stomach churned harder and faster, her belly expanded, swelling like a balloon. She could feel her skin stretch to its limit. Her body was definitely trying to expel something. It was time to take action. Peyton tiptoed downstairs. The TV was blaring one of her, fi one of her parents' crime shows, so she figured she could sneak into the kitchen undetected. She opened the refrigerator door and tried to decide on the best bait for luring a worm. There was no raw steak, but there was raw hamburger. She liked her burgers well done, so her stomach churned even harder as she thought of holding the cold, bloody beef on her tongue. Still, if doing so got rid of whatever was causing her such misery, it was worth the ick factor. It was amazing what a person was willing to do if they were desperate. She pinched off a piece of the meat, rolled it into a small ball, harmed it and headed back upstairs. Are you okay, Peyton? Her mum called from the living room. Yeah, I just got some ginger ale to settle my stomach, she called trying to stand as normal as possible. Good idea, her mum said. Let me know if you need anything, okay? Peyton didn't know if what she was about to do was really a good idea, but she had to do something. She sat down on the bed and placed the ball of raw ground beef on her tongue. It was clammy with the metallic taste of blood. As her body temperature warmed the clump of meat, it started to secrete its juices, the blood and grease running down her throat. She didn't want to swallow it, but she didn't want it back in her mouth either. She gagged violently, and bitter saliva combined with the meat juices in her mouth, filling it, um, yeah, filling it with a sickening mixture of fluids. She jumped up and ran to the bathroom, knowing that uh, at the very least she was going to throw up. But maybe that was all she needed to do, she told herself. Throwing up was awful, but sometimes when something made you so sick and you threw up, you felt better afterward. Maybe that's all that would happen, she told herself, but she knew she was telling herself a lie. She winced at the reflection in the bathroom mirror. She was pale and sweaty. Her skin had a strange greyish cast and there were dark half moons under her eyes. She could never remember looking this bad. Maybe this illness was too serious to take care of at home. Maybe she should tell her mum she needed to go to the hospital to have her stomach pumped. But if she told her mum about the pizza kit, would she also have to tell her she knew what happened to Marley? Would she have to admit that she had lied to a police officer? She was afraid that if she started talking, she wouldn't be able to stop and all her secrets would spill out. She couldn't take the risk of getting into that much trouble, so she waited. She opened her mouth wide, looking in the mirror, waiting for whatever it was to appear. She could see past her tongue to her uvula and into the dark tunnel of her throat. 
holding her mouth open made the urge to gag stronger. Especially as now tepid, uh, as the now tepid raw meat continued to ooze. The meat's greasy fluids pooled underneath her tongue. It was repulsive. She couldn't stop thinking about what she was holding in her mouth was a chunk of mut mutilated dead cow. If she made it through this experience, she was definitely becoming a vegetarian. The wait was excruciating. How long had it been? Minutes? Hours? It felt like it had been years and years. There was a slight movement in her abdomen. Was it the worm, or whatever it was, sensing the ground beef, sniffing it, if worms could smell, and starting to make its way toward it? But then it was still again. Had she only imagined it? She waited some more, sticky saliva pooling in her mouth. She desperately wanted to spit the meat into the sink, but she knew it was her best chance of solving the problem on her own. And then she felt it. Something was moving in her stomach. It felt like it was in uncoiling like a snake. She could feel the worm, if that's what, what it was, uh, pushing herself out of its stomach, pushing itself out of her stomach, sorry, and up her esophagus. But it was a different sensation than throwing up. The thing making its way up her torso was solid and slow. And then she was choking, coughing and retching. She looked in the mirror. Her throat was visibly pulsing as the thing inside her moved up the le length of her neck. I feel faint. <laughs> I feel so lightheaded right now. The words better out than in popped into her head. But in this case, she couldn't be sure that they were true. She didn't want the thing to stay inside her, but she was also afraid to see it. Her mouth popped open extra wide, like when the dentist pried it apart to fill, fit in its to fit in his tools. She looked at her gaping mouth in the mirror. She felt something wriggly against her palate. palate. I don't know what a palate is. <laughs> she leaned closer to the mirror to see better, then blinked to and shook her head because she couldn't believe what she saw. Fingers! Oh no! Oh! Oh! Moving fingers with petal pink polish. Marley's colour. By the way, this is good, good uh, alliteration. Marley's colour on the nails. The fingers were attached to a hand that she could see emerging from her stretched out throat. No, 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 no. She couldn't let whatever that hand was attached to come out where she could see it. She reached in her mouth, grabbed the hand and tried to shove it back into her esophagus. She swallowed as she shoved, trying to force it down, but the hand was too large and it kept moving, kept pushing her hand away like it was fighting her. Peyton gra gagged. Her body was trying to force out the very thing she was trying to force back in. She doubled over, heavy, uh, uh, sorry, heaving and sputtering. When she stood back up, her mouth stretched open so wide that her lips cracked and bled. <gasps> oh my god! The hand shot out of her mouth, its fingers blindly reaching and grabbing. In the mirror, Peyton saw herself, her jaws wrenched open like a snake swallowing a whole rat, except it was a girl's hand and wrist, not a rat's tail then protruded from her face. Her airway blocked by the emerging arm, Peyton wanted to breathe. She wanted to scream. Oh my god, certain she was going to suffocate if she didn't get help, she took a shaky step toward the bathroom door. So fast that she couldn't even process it, the hand re retreated back into her mouth and down her throat, into her body cavity. Peyton sucked in huge gasps of air and sank into a sitting position on the bathroom floor, too drained to make it back to her be bedroom. She leaned against the white tile wall and spat the raw meat ball into a wad of toilet paper. She used the bath towel to wipe the cold sweat from her face. She tried to process what had just happened. It definitely wasn't a worm that was inside her. There was no doubt in her mind that the hand that had shot out of her mouth was Marley's. She and Marley had done each other's nails at sleepovers. She knew her best friend's hand when she saw it. Her best friend. Marley was her best friend and she hadn't told anybody about her incident because she was afraid of getting in trouble. Maybe if she had told someone, Mrs Crutchfield, one of the factory workers, they could have found Marley in time to save her. And even if it had been too late, at least that way Marley's parents would have known what happened to her. They, c they wouldn't still be waiting and worrying. <coughs> But was Marley still alive? It had been her hand and it was moving, but she couldn't be alive and inside Peyton, could she? Peyton shook her head hard, as if doing so might reset her scrambled brain. Maybe she was having some kind of emotional breakdown. Maybe everything that had seemed so real was just in her imagination. Maybe the guilt of betraying Marley had destroyed her emotional health. 
Uh, the thought that none of this was real felt strangely comforting. She decided she would go to bed, get some sleep, and in the morning she would tell her mum that she was having a hard time dealing with Marley being missing and that maybe she should see a doctor. Peyton took several, ste uh, several deep breaths and stood up. The awful meaty taste was still in her mouth. She needed to brush her teeth. She squeezed the paste onto her toothbrush and regarded herself in the mirror. She still looked pale and exhausted but she wasn't sweaty and feverish looking like she had been before. She brushed her teeth and tongue, scrubbing away at the taste of blood and animal fat. She rinsed with water, then swished some minty mouthwash for good measure. That was better. She was going to get better. She just needed to ask for some help. She splashed her face with warm water and started to dry it off. As she rubbed the towel against her throat, she felt something l jump inside her neck. She looked in the mirror. Lumps were rising beneath the skin of her throat, moving around and rearranging themselves. Her skin is stretched and her veins bulged. No, Peyton thought. This isn't real. This isn't real because what I thought happened before wasn't real either. But the image in her mirror told a different story. Peyton put both hands on her throat to make sure she was seeing that what she was seeing wasn't an illusion. Some of the lumps were the size of grapes, others were nearly the size of golf balls. They moved under her fingers when she pressed on them, darting like they were trying to avoid her touch. She felt some kind of solid matter making its way up her throat, making it hard to breathe and impossible to yell for her parents, for someone to do something. She felt so alone, except she wasn't alone because of the intruding presence inside of her. She looked back at the mirror. Now there were lumps on her face too, large ones, moving around, distorting her, her features, straining the taut skin until it threatened to split. Her eyes bulged. Something was pushing hard behind them. She had never felt such intense pressure. Her eyes protruded out from her eyelids, opening so wide that she could see the orbs in their entirety. The whites, the dilated pupils, the bursting blood vessels. Pulpy red slop seeped then spewed from her eye sockets so forcefully that her eyeballs were propelled from her face like cannonballs blasting from a cannon. What? <laughs> one hit the mirror with a wet slap while the other one landed with a splat in the basin of the sink. Pressed together into a soft, solid mass, the bits of flesh and tissue squeezed from Peyton's empty eye sockets like fresh sausage being extruded, extruded from a meat grinder. What is this? What is this? The slop fell to the floor in long tubes. She could see nothing, but she could feel the pressure in her head building even more as it became fuller and fuller until she feared it might explode. The meaty remains of Peyton's best friend poured from her mouth and sprayed out of her nostrils in a sneeze that splattered the red compressed innards in onto the white bathroom tiles. Oh my god, I feel so lightheaded right now. Still, the pressure in her head grew throbbing like a huge hammer was pounding her skull from the inside. It was a strange sort of relief when the fleshy paste started squeezing out of her ears too. The pressure reduced, leaving Peyton so lightheaded she couldn't stand. She had never fainted, but she feared she might, unseeing, unhearing, unable to make any sound except a soft whimper in the back of her clogged throat. She collapsed to her knees on the bathroom floor. She fell into a mound of body temperature meat mush. Her fingers groped through silvers of skin, gobbets of organs, fragments of bone, all that was left of the friend she had turned her back on. Peyton couldn't scream, couldn't cry, but in between bouts, or boot, I don't know what that means, bouts of spewing out more crushed human remains, she did manage to whisper one name, Molly. Peyton sat up in bed with a start, stifling a scream. Her stomach voiled, and her diaphragm, spasmed, <laughs> her mouth filled with bitter saliva. There was no way to hold it back anymore. She was finally going to lose her lunch, violently. She jumped out of bed and ran. She stopped at the bathroom door for a second, but then kept running. For some reason, she didn't want what was going, uh, she didn't want what was going to come out of her to be inside the house, not even if she flushed it down the toilet. The remains of the pizza that churned inside her felt polluting, contaminating. She wanted it gone. She ran downstairs and out the front door. Once she was out on the porch, she took deep breaths of fresh air in hopes that it would ease her nausea. No such luck. She ran to the edge of the porch and retched into the bushes. Peyton had never vomited so violently or for so long. 
Clutching the stair railing to hold herself up, she spewed and spewed until she feared she would soon be vomiting up her own internal organs. How much longer is this going to go on for? Surely, she thought, there could be nothing left inside her. But then another wave would hit her and there would be more. Finally, there came several minutes of dry heaving. At last, she was empty. She tiptoed back into the house and locked the front door behind her. Her goal was to get back in bed without her parents noticing she had gone out. She was not in the mood to answer anybody's questions. All she wanted was to be left alone and to leave the terrible experiences of this day behind her. Lying back down, she felt marginally better. She was weak and sweaty and shaky, but at least her stomach wasn't tossing like a ship in a stormy sea. And emotionally, there was something cleansing about the nightmare pizza having been <laughs> purged from a system. Next animatronic nightmare pizza. It felt like a fresh start somehow. Peyton closed her eyes, hoping she could sleep the night through. Wait, didn't our eyeballs, like, pop out? Or was that fake? Oh, oh I, I must have lost track now. <laughs> I was... I, I was, yeah, I was going crazy over the eyeballs popping out. But there was a noise. It was a rustling noise coming from outside in the vicinity of the bushes where Peyton had emptied herself of the vile pizza. Oh, right, yeah, she just emptied herself rather than... Okay, no, that makes more sense. <laughs> it's probably just squirrels or one of the neighbourhood cats, Peyton thought. It would stop soon. The rustling didn't stop. Instead, it got louder, making it impossible for Peyton to sleep. She got out of bed, went to a window and opened it. The sound was definitely coming from the bushes where she had been sick. But wait, what if it was Marley? After this thought, the horrible what-ifs began to unspool in her brain. What if Marley wasn't coming back to joyously greet her friend? What if Marley was mad at her for not trying to save her, for not telling anyone, not even the police officer, that she had seen Marley fall? Peyton knew from the experience that Marley had a temper and held grudges against people when she thought they had wronged her. What if Marley was out for revenge? Another even more horrific thought spread like a stain in Peyton's head. What if Marley had fallen into the vat of boiling sauce and died, but had somehow managed to come back like in the dream she had just had, if it even had been a dream? What if what was outside was not really Marley, but somehow what was left of Marley? The doorbell rang. That's such a good short sentence. Peyton's heart pounded in panic. <laughs> the, the, they're really going for alliteration in this story. It's really working. Uh, Peyton's heart pounded in panic. She had to get away, but how? Unable to think of another choice, she opened the window and climbed out onto the ivy-covered lattice on the side of the house. One piece of wood shattered under her bare foot. The lattice clearly wasn't strong enough to support her for long. Still, she clung to it with a white knuckled grip. She had climbed out of the window with a thought of shimmying down the side of the house and running away, but now she realised that she was that going down the lattice would put her right next to the front porch, right next to Marley. There was no place to go but up. The lattice shook and squeaked as she climbed toward the roof. She grabbed the gutter and pulled herself up. She was so terrified she could hardly breathe, but even though she was afraid of heights, she was even more afraid of what was standing on her porch. It'll be okay, she told herself. I'll just sit on the roof till she's gone. Then I'll climb back through the window into the room. She flinched as she heard the doorbell ring again. Molly stood on the porch, waiting for the door to open. Oh my god. <laughs> Being missing had been kind of fun. No school, no responsibilities. But hiding out in the pizza factory had started to get old. She missed her boyfriend. Wait. Wait, what? What? Okay, now I'm confused. Oh, this this is like Kelsey level confusion uh, from the new kid. Um, I'll, I'll just read. Being missing had been kind of fun. No school, no responsibilities. But hiding out in the pizza factory had started to get old. She missed her boyfriend, missed regular meals and missed sleeping in her own bed. She'd gone to see her boyfriend first and now she was going to let Peyton know she was okay. Those visits were the first two phases of becoming unmissing. Then she would go back home for the required tearful reunion with her parents. Thunk. The sound came from the other side of the house. Marley ran down the porch steps to investigate. It was dark around the back of the house, so it took Marley a moment to make sense of the shape lying on the ground. But then she saw it was a girl about her size. Her neck was twisted 
and her head was tilted at a painful looking angle. Peyton's eyes wide open in a frozen look of terror seemed to be looking right at Marley, but Marley knew Peyton wasn't looking at her, would never look at anything again. Marley screamed. Oh! <laughs> oh! I hate FNAF lore. Oh! I'm gonna run around my room for a second. Ah! ah! I hope you could hear me screaming. Um, what was this story, man? Okay. So let me get this straight. There's this, there's this person called Peyton, right? She goes to the pizza factory with Marley, her best friend. And then Marley falls into a vat. And then Marley supposedly dies. Peyton, for some reason, doesn't tell anybody that Marley is missing. Um, and then Marley eats Peyton. Right? Marley eats Peyton. And then starts to feel sick. And then sicks her out. Just like, oh, just like how, um, just like how Michael sicked out Ennard, uh, in some way. Um, she sicked her out, now she's in this bush, but it turns out this entire time that Marley had just been alive. What? What is going on? <laughs> Can anybody else tell me what the hell is going on? Um, yeah, no, I'm, I am confused, man. This is like, this is proper uh, Kelsey from the new kid, you know, Kelsey going to a new school after being spring locked. Um, oh my god, this had so many twists and turns, I am feeling lightheaded, I need to end this video because it's getting longer than I thought it was first going to be. Oh my god, this was a story and a half, what do you guys think about it? Any theories on what actually happened? I'm going to go and rest for like 30 hours. Uh, <laughs> I will see you in the next audiobook, which is going to be the Stitch Race. The Stitch, the next Stitch Race. <laughs> There's a little preview for you if you want to read that. Um, Stitch Race, is it, Stitch Race actually seems very short this time. So uh, we're going to get a short, short Stitch Race story. I am ready. Okay. Anyway, goodbye.